Thank you very very much for uh, for this opportunity for this invitation. Uh, uh, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of uh, a team of two. Uh, I work with uh, with Jeremy Williams from the University of Exeter on uh, on these topics and uh, uh, art, science, and uh, and technology. This is my uh, work. What we are analyzing and uh, and discussing today as a from the point of view of the synergy. And, uh, and innovation. Uh, science and, and art uh, have always had a very interesting uh, relationship between, uh, be between them, between the two. Uh, both of them are languages to describe the word in, in some sense. Uh, both of them are ways to make sense of, the, uh, of what surrounds us and what is around us. And technology is a is a fantastic addition to uh, to enable the communication between between the two. Uh, it's not just providing tools, as we are going to see. It's a way to uh, make sure that the uh, that the two um, are communicating uh, and they are sometimes providing the right um, means for uh, for science and art to uh, to talk to each other. Uh, I'm a musician by training, uh, and so my first um, attempt at looking at the relationship between art and science is through uh, science and music. Um, and music is a wonderful example about how science uh, is providing uh, the, um, right, uh, the right language, a very powerful language to describe quite a lot of things that are happening in uh, in this world we know we can describe things like music notes um, uh, rhythm um, timbre through physical concepts like patterns like vibrations frequency spectra um, so we know we can use science as a way to describe uh, describe music and describe the uh, describe that and that is something that is not new uh, we know that in ancient greece um, there was a mathematical underpinning of music uh, the scientists of of those uh, of those times were intrigued by by the ways mu mathematics can describe certain characteristics of music uh, and Pythagoras in particular, uh, we know that he was very passionate about relating things like harmony, like how different sounds can be um, can work together uh, with ratios between between numbers. Um, but that is not is not the, not everything. Um, so that, that is just part of the story because at the same time, the ancient Greeks were Greeks were also fascinated by how music could provide an underpinning to understand and know the uh, the known universe. Um, scientists uh, and artists and musicians were looking for patterns in uh, in nature, in uh, and they were in search for a global harmony, what was called the music of the spheres. Uh, they were looking at the planets and the and the planetary motion. Um, Trying to uh, to, uh, to to describe them uh, through uh, harmony and music terms, like the entire solar systems played its own symphony, uh, and the 
During the, uh, the centuries, there were many attempts uh, about describing this in, uh, in, in different ways. And I, I really like this, um, this work by, Frank, by the Furious. Uh, we are uh, at, the, at the mid of the, um, of the 15th century here. Uh, and what I, I, really, uh, I really like about that is that it embraces in a very nice way uh, concerts were very far, uh, very far away. We have the muses here. Uh, we have the, um, the the planets like Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and here are the the music tones, the music modes like the um, mixolydians, the uh, the lydians, the phrygium, uh, and they are all part of the same graph, all part of the same uh, of the same uh, theoretical structure. And even if this is not the most accurate description or scientific description of the um, uh, of the solar systems and its relationship with with music, uh, I thought in a in a very nice poetic but effective way it brought the attention of the um, of scientists and uh, um, and humanists that there was something that needs to be brought together on the same page uh, that were embracing the world of the, uh, of the art, music, and, uh, and astronomy. And then we move to something, uh, one of my favorite things. And uh, uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, in, uh, 15, in 1619, he published a wonderful, monumental um, book uh, called the Harmonisus Mundi, so the harm on the harmony of the world. Uh, and, then, and he made this wonderful discovery, analyzing Lots of data uh, from his um, of his mentor Tycho Brahe, and he discovered that planets are moving on elliptic orbits, um, and the and the planets around the sun were accelerating and decelerating depending on how far or close they were to the sun. And his problem was to how to communicate that to his audience, how to communicate this new idea that planets were going slower and faster, they were moving around the sun with uh, an elliptic orbit, um, and, um, and what was the, the best way to convey that message? Well, of course, he could use geometry, and he was, as you can see here, he was very, very skilled uh, in terms of, uh, of, using, um, of using mathematics about um, to describe a physical concept. But that is the way he chose uh, to, um, to communicate his main discovery. He used music. He thought that music was the right language, the right way to summarize his discovery and to put it in a way that was easy to communicate and understand. Then each music note here is the mapping, is mapped to the speed, to the velocity of the planet around the sun. So if we can see nodes here going up and down, that means that the, so the planet is going faster and then it's going slower. And we can see that Mars, for example, compared to Jupiter, has a quite bigger variation in terms of velocity, going faster and then slower in a much more uh, macroscopic way than Jupiter. And Mercury here even more. Um, Venus on the other side has an, op has an orbit which is almost circular, and uh, there is almost no variation um, of the velocity. Earth has a tiny variation, so just a semi-turn in music terms. And, uh, and I like that. I like that because it's, in, it's very modern. It's a way of using art as an effective, powerful way to describe science. So we can say that science has something in um, something for um, for the art as a uh, source of inspiration, providing new ideas. Um, and we we know that science in um, in the uh, in history provided new tools and new materials and. Uh, and new ways of creating art. And um, I'm thinking particularly about um, certain forms of art that are strictly relating, strictly 
relying on uh, on science and mathematics. And uh, one of these is architecture. And um, uh, Anthony Anthony Gaudí is a uh, is an architect from uh, from Spain uh, from, from Catalonia, and he um, he used quite a lot mathematical forms like paraboloids, hyperboloids, helicoids as a way to shape light and shape the space uh, in a such a beautiful, wonderful, complete way that you almost don't need anything else. You don't even need to paint the structure to paint the room because the light is curved and is and is shaped by the shades of the mathematical structures. And also he used uh, forms and shapes borrowed from, from nature. This is a sea urchin inspired uh, chandelier or a lamp here. Um, so science is providing new material to the artist um, in, a, in a quite different way. Uh, science provided new techniques and new tools to, to artists. And here we are going to see an interesting transformation. Oil painting is all based it's a, it's a very chemistry-based form of art where you actually need um, dyeing, you need, uh, um, you need colors, you need um, oil, you need medium, uh, and there is quite a lot of, there were quite a lot of debates in the uh, 14th, 15th century about how to, uh, how to stabilize colors and make sure that they were there in, uh, for the for the for the next years, without cracking, without discoloration, uh, and the uh, and the scientists of the time were in, all involved in a, in a quest for so to get the best colors or to get the best techniques to uh, to avoid cracking or to avoid uh, and the and what was really interesting that we we see the um, some of the artists actually embracing science like Leonardo, for example, and starting studying new ways of making painting, of making uh, new colors, inventing new techniques, understanding, for example, that slow cooking the oil was preventing cracks, and adding a little bit of beeswax was, again, helping preventing um, cracks in the, in the painting and stabilizing the colors. So art is not just... Uh, served and, uh, and helped by science, but art was providing the pretext and the, uh, and the trigger to drive new science and to drive new discoveries, in this case, in, in chemistry. And let's see what happens if we add, if we add technology in the, in the equation. Um, so a question here for, for you. So what do you think was the first device able to transmit music across long distances. And if we think about that, probably many of us think it was probably the radio or the uh, um, some form of the of radio transmission. Um, but actually, the very first music broadcast using, uh, using electricity, using technology, was something called the musical telegraph, an invention by Alicia Gray in, uh, that was patented in 1875 and used for the first time in 1876 in a concert. And that is how it looks like. It's a nice little keyboard connected to telegraph switches. And the, the idea was to use the telegraph line to send the music signals far away. And on the other side, there were a vibrating needle. They were vibrating on a on a metal plate, bolted on a on the on, a, on the back of a violin to actually um, vibrate at, at the right frequency to reproduce the note corresponding to the key that was pressed. And what I find what is ex absolutely fascinating about this is that the telegraph was not invented to send music. The telegraph was invented to send information, text, letters, words, was invented in a completely different environment, in a different, uh, in a different landscape and ecosystem. But the artist wanted to push 
technology, to push the boundary, to hack technology in some way, to make sure they, they could satisfy their needs of reaching out, of communicating to the, to the widest possible audience. And, the, and so new things like the Music Telegraph was born. Another example is coming from, the, from literature in this case. La Plissure du Text uh, was a work by uh, Roy Askant that in uh, 1980 at the uh, National Arts Museum in Paris um, thought about creating an interactive, remote, collaborative work of art based on a, on a distributed text. Uh, he called it a, a planetary fairy tale, uh, like a global uh, big fairy tale story that was collaboratively, collectively created from 11 different locations in US, Canada, Europe, Australia. And each location was charged with, was responsible for one particular character of the story, the magician, the princess, the beast. Uh, and they, the only thing they had was something similar to a typewriter typed out. No pictures, no other way of expressing their thoughts other than text. And that is what, they, what the author started doing. They were bending and they were the, the, the rules of, the, of, of text and, uh, and, and, and going beyond the boundaries and the limitations of, of text, um, creating art, creating visual things like this, or like a lion here, you can see. Again, it was not the telegram, so the, the typewriter was not meant to create uh, graphics or art in a, in, a, in a visual form. And yet, the artist went around that limitation and went beyond the limitation of technology. In other words, art always challenged technology and provided the inspiration and the trigger and the motivation to, uh, to get better, more powerful, uh, devices to, to satisfy the very fundamental need of the artist to uh, to express themselves and to uh, and to reach out. So, in modern terms, um, as we are as we are going to explore uh, later, we um, we don't have telegraph anymore. We have something different called the internet and called research networks as giant. In, uh, in, in the UK, Red Clara in Latin America, um, Internet 2 in the US. Uh, and these networks are quite special because they allow a very high quality communication between, between sites, between research sites or universities. And this is something uh, I, I just want to show you something happened a few years ago where we organized a remote concert over the network uh, between so joining two uh, locations, uh, we got Edinburgh here in Scotland and Amsterdam, uh, and there were 1,200 kilometers, so 800 miles between them. Uh, and the idea was using the network to remotely put uh, bringing musicians on the same stage so that they could improvise, they could play together. Uh, and we did that in uh, 2013. Um, with a jazz improvisation of the network. And here you can see the trumpet, the trumpet player here, that he was physically 1,200 miles away from the rest of the musicians that were um, here playing. And uh, let me show you. That's it. So how this is the new version, the 2013 version of the of the music telegraph by Alicia Gray. It's the it's same concept. 
is using the network that was not designed to transmit video and audio and bringing artists together. It was designed to send information and to access archives and files and folders and share text information 30 years ago. And yet, artists have made their own way and try and manage to use the network to communicate and to reach out and to create something absolutely wonderful, like the possibility of being together on the same stage and make music, or even they are uh, even being in, uh, in different countries, speaking different languages in, a, in, a, uh, in an absolutely wonderful, unthinkable way. So technology is definitely there to provide this communication channel and to enable the communication between science and art. And we have seen how art is, uh, is actually being a nice um, trigger for innovation in, uh, for, uh, for science and technology. But there is another very important aspect I would, like to, I would like to bring to the table and discuss and share with you. And that's something I'm very much involved in with Genevieve. And it is how science can be used to create art. How science can naturally be uh, a, a, an absolutely wonderful, unique way of conveying the beautiful and wonderful and rich uh, world that surrounds us into, uh, into a different language. We know that science is a way to describe nature. That was, was all the mathematical formula and physics that we are, we are used to seeing books um, about. They are ways of describing phenomena and make sense of what's happening around us. And, um, and art, it, art can just be another language to do the same thing. Uh, artists do the same, a very similar job to scientists when they are interpreting and they are communicating what they, what they feel and what they, what they see around, around them. Uh, so there is a nice way of, um, of bringing the two together. And again, as a musician, I'm, I'm of course biased. And my favorite way of doing that is using a technique called data sonification to create music for science. And the idea of sonification is very, very simple. We start from anything uh, around us. So in this case, it's a plant growing. We can map that to, uh, to things we can listen to, like uh, notes in a music scale. And the main idea is that anything can become music and anything um, becoming music through a mapping process, a sonification process, is inheriting the main properties of the data. Let me give you an example. Imagine you, do, you run your experiment. Uh, you get data like this that are growing linearly. Uh, that, so if we do a graph, they are nicely on a line like this. Well, if we use uh, this mapping um, concept where we are associating the pitch of the node to the, uh, to the value of the, um, of the experiment, we have an, a line in a, in a score or in a piano roll here. And as you can see, we have a melody that is growing linearly exactly like, the, like our data. And if we listen to that, we have a growing melody. So linear data, linear melody, growing, growing melody. So far, so good. Nothing really exciting up to now. And look at what happens if our data is starting to be slightly more interesting. For example, they have, if the data has some structural properties, like in this case, we have a modular model that is repeated two times. Uh, in technical terms, we say the data is periodic because uh, we have a kind of a template and the template is repeated two times. And the data is going up and then it's going down and then up again and down again. We use exactly the same method, the same mapping. And here you can see we have something going up and down and we have here a melody going up and down in exactly the same way. The shape of the melody 
is inheriting and representing the shape of my data. And the melody becomes immediately more interesting. Data is more interesting, is richer, more structured, more, um, um, <clears throat> uh, has something more to say in some way. And the music immediately inherits that. And using that, uh, we, we worked with CERN uh, a few years ago when uh, in 2012, uh, CERN announced the discovery of a new a new particle, something that um, entered, of course, made the, made the history of uh, of CERN and of particle physics. Uh, this new particle was called the Higgs boson, and this is a graph that was published in 2012. And this is the signature, the proof that this new particle is discovered. Now, physicists are extremely excited about, about this, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and the, uh, the, what makes them really excited is this, time, is this peak here that is uh, sealed in, uh, in yellow here. And this peak, the, the presence of this peak here, means that the Higgs boson is there. So what we did was mapping all these values here to uh, music notes. This is basically the same thing that Kepler did uh, 500 years ago by mapping the velocity of the planets to, to music notes. So that is our starting point. And that is the how it looks like on a, on a piano roll, so on a score. And you can see here, that's our peak. And that is the peak in, uh, in our score. And that is on a conventional music score. Uh, representation where you can see here these three top nodes are the signature of the Higgs boson. So, and I, I can play a little bit of that so just to so have an idea about how it sounds like. Uh, not bad. Uh, and I, if we close our eyes, we can clearly identify where the Higgs boson actually is, the three highest notes that we can hear in the piece. There. Are the music equivalent of the, uh, of the graph where we have the highest points there. And so what we did was, well, we have a melody. Why don't we try to do a little bit of uh, orchestration with that and we can, uh, we can and write a little music piece.
and so on. So this is the, just a little example about how we can start from something quite dry, like, um, like a graph. Uh, you can create something that uh, has a nice structure by mapping uh, in this case, we use a, just a diatonic scale to map the um, to map the the interval between between the numbers to uh, intervals between nodes, and then add a, just a little bit of um, um, of music instruments and arrangements, and starting working on that. Uh, we found that quite interesting, also working with schools, for example, uh, and we worked last year in particular with uh, with a group of uh, of students in. Um, uh, in a village in France, uh, ha having them collecting data with the temperature of the water uh, uh, and the, the brightness of the uh, of the of the day, and having them mapping uh, these numbers to music scale, and then orchestrating this uh, together and creating something together uh, as a collaborative form of art between uh, between students, music students. Um, and um, and then play that together uh, and share with the community exactly as you share the result of your research in uh, uh, with the presentation. In that case, it was a concert. Uh, and using exactly the same principle, so the uh, uh, good old uh, Kepler's idea of uh, of mapping um, mapping physical characteristics and physical. Uh, quantities to um, to music intervals. Uh, we did another uh, little experiment with, again with CERN, um, uh, and that was called LHC uh, Chamber Music. You find the whole uh, video on YouTube if you just look for LHC, LHC Chamber Music uh, written this way. You find that uh, the idea was uh, trying to celebrate and communicate the idea of scientists working together. Um, CERN experiments are based on huge collaborations where scientists have to work together. Uh, and sometimes different experiments might have slightly different perspectives, but they all contribute to the global knowledge and they're all essential to bring different angles, different perspectives to the global knowledge that is, um, that is the um, the physics discovery and the physics that is done there. So what we did was uh, asking seven scientists where they were uh, also musicians, so they were scientists and musicians at the same time, to play the sonification of their own data. So we ask we ask uh, to each scientist to provide us with some data they were working on. Uh, and we converted this data into, into music pieces. Uh, and we wanted them to play their own sonification next to the detector, to the machine that captured that data. Uh, and then we, we put them together uh, in a, with a little bit of video editing uh, in, a, in a global single music piece as a metaphor of scientific collaboration. Let me show you that. Um, so this is CERN. So this is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. That's Geneva Airport. Uh, it's 27 kilometers long, uh, and we we see that as a as a uh, as a circle overlay to the uh, to the um, to the landscape because actually this is running underground, uh, and the, these names here, Atlas, Alice. LHCB CMS are the names of the four experiments that are part of this big collaborations. So these um, these experiments are actually uh, the actual locations where um, data is collected, and uh, they all contribute to the same global uh, physics of LHC. So what we did was having a clarinet player and a violin player uh, in the Atlas location next to the Atlas detector. We had a pianist uh, next to the Alice detector. You can see part of the detector is here. We had a flute and a guitar player next to the CMS detector. And this lady here, Schiana Mariotti, she uh, is the uh, at the time, she was the uh, um, 
head of the uh, Higgs boson physics at CMS, and she was playing her own signification of the uh, of the data. We got a violin in uh, playing in LHCb, uh, and that since we wanted to represent the global accelerator as well, we got data related to the particles going through the accelerator and map them to uh, to harp to a harp score and we had the harpist here playing in the control room and that by the way was a fantastic social experiment the people here you can see it are working on their computers uh, and they're normally quite stressed about uh, what's happening in the in real in their real life where the experiment is on but absolutely wonderful having a harpist playing in the, in the control rooms and they asked us when are you doing the next the next piece the next recording that's so wonderful we have all, all, all the time and so let me show you what was the result of all these people um, playing together That's the LHC chamber music. Uh, again, the main idea that I think music expressed in a, an absolutely wonderful and powerful way is that you can actually listen to each melody separately, and that works. That, that's absolutely fine. If you uh, listen to the uh, entire YouTube video, it's 12 minutes, you can hear one by one all the musicians that are playing their own music. And that makes sense. But when they are playing together, when they are brought together, where all the scientists are actually talking to each other, they are interacting, we start seeing things and we are, that, are, that were impossible to see before because we got harmonies, we got fragments that are created by the interaction of different single melodies and different phrases that are played together. It's the power of, uh, of different contributions that are made at the same time in a collaborative way. And the music was such a powerful way of communicating that, of making that, uh, make that real and tangible and not just an idea. So concluding, um, art and science um, is not just an inspiration um, what, what links them. It's not just that art is inspiring science or is inspired by science but it's a continuous synergy. And what I love about that is a two-way communication. Uh, art takes a lot from, from science. Uh, we've seen that in architecture, in painting, uh, in, uh, in the sonification I, 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 normally, I normally do with Genevieve. Uh, and it's, um, it's, but it's not just that. Art is providing new ways of communicating science. It's providing new ways um, of making discoveries and uh, of reaching out. Um, there are quite a lot of discoveries in science that, are, that were enabled by, by, by this idea that the, um, the world around us is, is beautiful, is, is, is perfect, and this, uh, the sheer concept of symmetry, for example, was the guiding principle for the most successful model in particle physics. And this what was at the basis of things like the um, um, the table of the um, of the elements um, of the, in chemistry, um, and uh, so art is a, is, an, is not just an inspiration. It, it can be a tool for science. It can be used as a way to 
uh, to improve and perfection uh, and bring science to life in a different way. So art can be the ultimate tool for science in some way. And on the other hand, science can create beautiful art, not just by inspiring it, but through a mapping process, the beauty of science, the beauty of the world around us, the beauty of the universe uh, and, the, and its regularities and chaos and properties and structure can be mapped to, uh, to music. Can be mapped. And, uh, and having something that can truly convey that power uh, and, um, uh, and that uh, absolutely uh, uh, unique and stunning um, uh, environment. So art can be a unique and powerful drive for, uh, for science and, uh, and technology, and they're really key for, uh, for innovation. And the innovation and the can only happen when they are when art and science and technology can talk to each other, it can be brought together on the same uh, on the same space. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your contribution with the lab. Thank you. Thank you for and having me. Thank you for and, uh, and really happy to answer question. Excellent. Thank you for accepting to be our advisor of the lab also as well. Thank you.